Well, good, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to uh, what's now become the annual State of the Department of Medicine uh, presentation that we get to give. Before I start, I want to uh, first give a, uh, a thank you. And the thank you goes out to uh, Kathy Garzio, uh, Sumbul Desai, and maybe mostly Errol Osdaga for the amount of work that they, uh, they put into uh, helping collect all of this and put this presentation together. So, so thank you. The, the second becomes my series of disclaimers that while I thank them, I certainly will accept all responsibility for, uh, for everything that we're going to show and talk about, um, including later tonight, please don't send me any emails that I forgot to mention you, uh, because uh, uh, what I'm trying to do here is to give you a representation of what's going on in the department. And if I err in anything, I show more junior faculty than senior faculty. And, uh, and try to break it up over the last few years with acknowledging different groups of people. Because one of the things you realize as you start to put together a presentation like this is how extraordinary you all are. That the amount of uh, exciting work that's going on in the department is nothing short of remarkable. 
And so thank you for all of that. It's really a privilege to, uh, uh, to serve in this role and to have an opportunity to reflect on all the great things that as a group we're collectively doing. So what are we going to try to do today? We're going we're to try to talk about what's been going on in the department over the last couple of years, and we're going to really talk about a lot of the, uh, the investments that have gone on across the three missions in the clinical enterprise, in research and education, and then really turn the focus on to uh, what do we really want to do over the course of the next year, the next three years, the next five years. Part of this is a, uh, a moving target as, uh, as the world continues to change, that uh, as we all know that the delivery of care is changing, the way research is financed is changing, and so we're going to be asking a lot from the people in the audience about helping us think through how we can continue to position ourselves at Stanford as an outstanding department of medicine. And some of you will recall that over the course of the last uh, five years, shortly after I got here and we had a series of uh, planning retreats, what we really talked about in the Department of Medicine is uh, four strategic points of, uh, of a plan. And the first one was I, what I call the protect and defend principle, which is really do what Stanford does well. And let's make sure that we're investing in science and research. The second was something that I think was really important when I arrived five years ago, and that is this notion of elevating the culture of clinical care. Dean Miner also talks about this, of making clinical care at Stanford as important as the research mission, as important as the educational mission. The third is something I think we're still striving to do, uh, but for which I do believe we have amongst the best opportunities in the country, and that is how do we connect the science to the clinical? How do we connect one and two? And our ability, a lot of the investment in science that we're making over the next few years will really be on trying to build infrastructure that allows faculty to take discovery ideas into the clinic or to take clinical ideas into populations in the community. And then finally, here at Stanford, we are, as you know well, a uh, world-class university. And the emphasis can't be overplaced on education and training the next generation. So let's start with sort of what I'll call the big picture of themes that we want to address today. And that's come out of um, what's called a climate survey that was, uh, that was administered over the course of uh, this winter to really understand what was the viewpoint of the faculty in the department. Uh, as Dean Miner began to think about the next few years in the Department of Medicine and, uh, and, and you know, my leadership in the Department of Medicine, he asked if I'd be willing to do something that had been routinely done when chairs had, uh, had stepped aside and they were getting ready for the next chair, is that could they learn about the department from an intense surveying of its current faculty? And prior chairs had noted to the dean this was actually something they wished that they had had while they were in place as chair, that they had had this information to help inform their strategic planning. So we agreed to go ahead with this, and many of you in the audience participated in it. We had almost 50% of our faculty, which from a survey perspective is pretty darn good. Uh, and this was a highly confidential survey administered by the provost's office. All the analyses were done by the provost's office. They used uh, well-established methods in survey research. And what I'm going to do is share with you some of the data and then wrap that data around the rest of the presentation where we can really think about what are some of the themes that faculty are bringing up as being important to your lives in being able to succeed in the clinical domain, the research domain, and the education domain. Well, first off, uh, the 50% who did respond look pretty much like the entire faculty. So this is, this undoubted, all, all surveying is a, uh, is a biased sample in some regard. And so people who chose to answer represent a certain group of faculty. But at least if you look at the gender um, uh, breakdown, if you look at the rank, if you look at the faculty line, it largely looks like the overall faculty in the Department of Medicine. So that's good that we can get a nice representation of, uh, of faculty voice. And what did we learn? Now the data are analyzed, as I said, and interpreted by the faculty. We've distributed the climate survey in the last few weeks to all of the division chiefs. And I know some of the divisions have begun to, 
talk about the climate survey at, um, at faculty meetings. And, uh, and we're going to continue to do this as we begin to think about really what is it that can make your lives, your jobs better over the course of the next few years. Now, the good piece of news is that faculty are generally satisfied and engaged. And we'll show you some of this data as we uh, go through. Faculty, not surprisingly, feel more included at the divisional level than the department level. And what it comes out is really has to do with size and uh, the people that they're most proximate with, whether they're doing their clinical work or they're doing their research. Faculty are also looking for more opportunity to interact with leadership of the department, and they want to be more engaged in departmental decision making. And that's a theme that we'll come back to. Now, as you break down the data and look at satisfaction as a faculty member, as I said, faculty generally satisfied uh, with their role as a faculty member here in Stanford. But we see some differences that I think are worth thinking about. First off, our women faculty are, uh, are less satisfied with their role than, uh, than men. Uh, assistant and associate professors are less satisfied than, uh, than our full professors, not surprising. And our CE faculty members are, um, are less satisfied with their roles than either MCL or UTL and NCL, NCL, NTL faculty. Now, some of that is overlapping. Uh, that we have uh, more women faculty who are in the assistant professor ranks than we do women faculty in senior uh, professor ranks. But some of it is, was perhaps a bit surprising. And one of the things that's come up throughout the survey is some of the challenges that the associate professors are feeling. And as I reflect upon this and have talked to uh, many people at the associate professor level as well as uh, division chiefs, it used to be that the first five years of faculty life were really the, the difficult ones. Getting started in your lab, getting started in your clinical programs, getting started in faculty life. But we've put such an emphasis on providing support for assistant professors, mentorship programs for assistant professors, startup packages for assistant professors, that what's happening is that now years six, eight, nine, ten are becoming difficult years. Uh, funding is tough. Clinical demands are high. And so one of the things that this has pointed out to a lot of us in leadership is we've got to give some more thought to that mid-career faculty who both they and us have invested an enormous amount into and how can we um, do better for them. Now we're going to include a group of uh, quotes that are taken directly from the report. We've tried to make sure that none of these quotes would be um, you know, easily identifiable. So for example, if Abraham Verghese says, there's a jerk in the office next to me, then, then, then I would know who that was. <laughs> but, um, but these, we, we've tried to take representative quotes that I think will start to give you uh, some insight into some of the things we want to talk about. So you can read this one here. I feel that I can be and am open with the leadership of my department on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but the environment does not always fo fo foster openness about issues. And that gets to the next issue about inclusiveness. That in general, our faculty do feel included as part of the Stanford community. But we see some of the same themes that we've noted on the last. Our women faculty feel less included than the men. Our younger faculty feel less included than the senior professors. And in particular, our clinicians uh, feel substantially less included in, uh, in faculty life and community life uh, than some of our science-oriented faculty. And that's something I think we need to think about. And some of the faculty quotes are seen here. Given the size of the department, I recognize the challenge of having everyone feel included. However, some of the ways we've chosen to divide ourselves may be contributing to that. Collaborations are difficult. Stanford is certainly known as the let a thousand flowers bloom, but in an era of team science and team clinical care, do we want to somehow foster a better environment where people can think about inclusiveness through the team? And this is something that I think is a really important comment for our, uh, for our clinical faculty. We are in clinic too much to really feel like we are part of an academic department of medicine. And one of the things that we're going to talk about is as we move out into the community, and we're very proud of the fact that we have satellite sites throughout the Bay Area, but how are we as a community going to make people feel included? Now, one of the ways we're going to do it is through technology. And Jack is sitting in the back there. And Jack's going to tell me how many people are now watching online, Jack. 
Almost 50 people are now watching online, and I think that's a tremendous way of thinking about how to include people uh, because not everybody can be here. Some people are seeing patients down in Santa Clara. Some people are seeing patients up in Redwood City. And how do we, over in the East Bay, how do we make them feel included? There's also an issue that I think we're going to return to over and over in the, next, in the course of the next five years, and that's the issue around diversity and social inclusiveness. And that on average, not surprisingly, men tend to perceive that the climate and opportunities for women and for minority faculty are as good as they are for them. Uh, surprising? Women don't feel that same perception. Uh, so these are the kind of things that we need to think about, both in conscious bias and unconscious bias, that we need to be attentive to as a faculty. Women also seem to be less confident than their male colleagues in navigating the so-called unwritten rules of the community. And, uh, and in a similar way, medical center line and clinician educator faculty feel less confident than UTL and NTL about navigating some of the cultural norms of, uh, of Stanford. Now, what do our faculty tell us that what's important to all of you? Resources matter. But also what matters is a spirit of collegiality, a spirit of collaboration, a spirit of cooperation uh, that create an environment where people feel that they can get their work done and also feel fulfilled in that. People want to feel appreciated for their work. Respect from leaders at all levels is critical. And faculty want to be included. They want to be included in decision making and they want to be included in communication. It's one of the reasons I'm taking the time to go through some of the details of the climate survey to really let you know uh, that if you took the time to answer the climate survey, we do want to communicate both what it found, but also how we're thinking about this. And so how are we thinking about this? Well, the first series of things I'm going to go through is some of the accomplishments, be it on the science side, the clinical side, We'll start to point out some of the programs and things that some people may not know about, uh, some of the things that we're thinking about for the next few years, and, uh, and try to get you engaged in a dialogue over the course of, uh, of the next several months to year as we do strategic planning along with Stanford Medicine and Stanford University. So I think one of the first challenges in a department like ours is unlike a lot of departments of medicine in the East Coast, which have been fairly stable in terms of their growth, our faculty has grown tremendously over the course of, uh, of the last five years. It's grown almost 200 faculty uh, since fiscal year 12, and it was at 541 in May. I suspect that it's already uh, above that. And if, if Andy Hoffman were in the crowd, he'd tell me exactly how many people it was as of, uh, as of today. Much of that growth has been through the addition of clinical faculty. So it's important that we begin to think about how do we best serve the needs of our clinical faculty where there has been a lot of growth. But there's also, if you think about the size of the MCL faculty, the size of the UTL faculty, there's been enormous growth in those lines as well. Almost 50 faculty members in the MCL or UTL lines uh, with people largely here for the majority of their time to concentrate on science. You'll also note as we go through the, science, the slides, we're going to embed a lot of activity that you'll see of faculty, trainees, staff uh, on social media to give you a sense of some of the things that faculty are doing. Well, as we look at our dashboard on diversity, I think that there's some good news here and there's some opportunity for improvement. The good news is, is with regard to our recruitment of women faculty, we're actually above, as a Department of Medicine, the external AAMC benchmarks. We're actually above what the School of Medicine has seen as a whole. But I'd also caution us not to, uh, to, to just say, well, that's great with regard to uh, gender diversity, uh, because a lot of those women faculty are at the assistant and associate professor level. And we really have to create an environment where both our men and women faculty feel confident and comfortable that they can progress through uh, the promotion ranks. For the category of underrepresented in medicine, uh, we're not doing as well as either the school or national benchmarks. And we can do better. And we're going to talk about some of that because I think one of the places that this really begins is in our residency program. And under the leadership of uh, the residency program directors, and maybe most particularly Wendy Caceres, who's joined us as, uh, as one of the leaders in the department around diversity, I think we're making some inroads. Well, one of the key, I think, accomplishments of the last few years has been um, faculty compensation. 
and the changing of our plans for faculty compensation. Now, compensation is, uh, is certainly an important topic, but I think what underlines, what underlies the compensation plan is probably more important because it's a series of principles that I think uh, were considered to be quite important by the vice chairs and the division chiefs. Uh, one of the things that struck me as odd when I arrived here is that scientists who saw patients, the UTL faculty, received no compensation for that. It was not a mechanism by which they were paid for that. Well, that was because in an earlier era, uh, they were wa people wanted to discourage them from seeing patients, to get back to the laboratory and, uh, and write grants and uh, papers. We, in fact, think that that's a mistake, that if you, uh, you want to be in the lab 100% of the time, fantastic, let's support that. But if you're a physician scientist, a clinician scientist who wants to see patients, let's incentivize you to do that. Um, bonuses we wanted to make sure were not just individual, but were also team-based. We also heard from the faculty that living in this area with a high cost of living was quite stressful. And to depend upon a large amount of their salary coming across as incentive rather than fixed was problematic. So we changed all the salary scales. We elevated the the, uh, the, sal the base salaries with the help of Sue Kingston in the dean's office. And now I think that we acknowledged increases when people were promoted. We acknowledged increases as time and rank went by. And we really did this in a way was to emphasize equity and to emphasize transparency. And I think we've achieved that. We also said, as I said at the outset, that if we're going to invest in science, we really had to invest in science. And so a sizable amount of money is now designated to support the compensation of our scientists in the department. It's approximately 20% of salary of our UTL and NTL faculty is supported through the central department, which makes it sound like I support it, but it really isn't. It's the clinicians who are generating that income that is supporting the science in the department. So thank you to those who are doing clinical medicine. Four million dollars a year in the department to support science salaries. We also see that, as I said, it's, uh, the, the salaries, I think, now are, are, are more equitable than they had been. And in fact, in analyses, we see very little difference by, uh, by gender and other categories if we adjust for years in rank. That's a good thing. What are some of the other programs that have been created and are being invested in? There's a new division of, uh, of hospital medicine. Uh, with the acknowledgement that general internal medicine, uh, the inpatient side and the outpatient side were emerging as distinctly different disciplines. And so we're pleased to have a new division of hospital medicine and Nira Ahuja has served as the first interim chief in a, uh, in, in a really capable and exciting way. We have new division chiefs over the past few years in GI, immunology, oncology, primary care, and it's really a pleasure to both thank Linda Boxer for her years of service as a division chief and to acknowledge Ravi Majetti as the new hematology division chief. And we'll come back to Ravi in a bit. Uh, primary care under Song Chang's leadership and Steve Ash on the research side has really been recast not just to think about primary care, but also to think about the emergence, emerging importance of, uh, of population health. Ken Mahaffey has done an incredible job at creating and leading the Stanford Center for Clinical Research. We're delighted in pulmonary to have the Sean Parker Center for Allergy and, uh, and Asthma under uh, Mark Nichols and Kerry Nadeau's leadership. The Center for Digital Health, led by Mintu Taraki and Sumble Decide, has been uh, uh, a tremendous success early on. And then in keeping with novel and innovative programs in, uh, in education, over the last few years, we've launched two master's degree programs through the department. The first is a Master of Science in Community Health and Prevention, which is run out of the division of Stanford Prevention Research Center. And uh, the master's degree in Physician Assistance Program is a, uh, is, is a special delight to announce, uh, because here was a program, the Physician Assistance Program, which is in the Department of Medicine for decades. It's now moved as a master's degree program to, uh, to the dean's office, and I think with our entering class of 27 this summer will be a uh, tremendous success and dedicated to a lot of the people in this room. And I see Quinn McKenna, our COO from SHC, and Quinn, thank you for your help and, uh, and support of the PA program. Other programs, I think I saw David Speck. Yes, there he is. And uh, David has really done a tremendous job along with Dean Winslow and others in creating and now leading uh, new clinical programs at Valley Care. We now have almost, I think it's 25 faculty members from the Department of Medicine seeing patients over at Valley Care. 
and there's almost another 20 from other departments. We have almost 50 faculty members now seeing patients at Valley Care, which I think is extraordinary. There's been an investment in uh, data for population health science. Dr. Cullen is uh, deeply appreciative of that, uh, of that investment. And some of the collaborations with Intermountain have been uh, both interesting and exciting. And uh, Henley G from uh, Oncology has embarked upon a terrific program in genomics and using some of the resources of uh, the Intermountain population for that. And Steve Ash, who I also saw earlier, is in the process of uh, creating a new training program in population health science in collaboration with Intermountain. We've invested tremendously in the infrastructure to support research, including the Stanford Center for Clinical Research, the QSU under Manisha's leadership, who's here, and, uh, and the TRAM program continues to uh, be a tremendous source of support for the translational and basic investigator. Ann Weinecker and Paul Heidenreck lead the quality efforts for the department. Actually, Ann now leads them for all of SHC. And, uh, and, and we were able to establish our first clinical quality council and we've held our first Department of Medicine quality retreat, and we have our second one uh, scheduled for later this fall. As a department, when I arrived, we were largely a department on campus, um, and that brings a lot of benefit. It also brings some challenges as we grow in terms of both being able to accommodate our patient populations, but also our, um, our science populations and programs. And I think many of you know that the university has broken grounds on moving substantial amounts of uh, university administrative services to Redwood City by 2019. And if you fast forward into the mid-2020s, I think that Redwood City will be not just a, a place for administrative services, but also will be a campus that has a lot of richness in, uh, in clinical medicine, and in the clinical sciences. The new Center for Academic Medicine, which will be uh, breaking ground later this year and being built over in the parking lot area across the street from Packard behind, uh, behind, the, Stanford, uh, be, behind the Stanford Hospital and, uh, and Packard Hospital, will be ready for occupancy by 2019. And uh, this will be a place for clinicians, clinician scientists, clinical research programs, training programs, et cetera. There'll also be a uh, child care center uh, built next to it. Uh, I'm really pleased today, we're Eric and Chris. Uh, there they are, that our two friends, previously of the athletic department, now of the Department of Medicine, at least for part of their time, as they've moved over a series of educational programs uh, from main campus in health and human performance. And so I think this is going to give us an opportunity to really get into areas of wellness, prevention, health uh, for the students, for ourselves as a faculty and staff. And I think there's also some interesting uh, research programs that can be built into this. Be Well remains a critical piece of uh, employee wellness and uh, administered and led out of SPRC. And I'm really pleased for those of you who haven't heard about the appointment of Tate Schenefeld as the new chief wellness officer and senior associate dean for, uh, for, for wellness. Tate is, uh, while he'll have an enterprise-wide role, is a hematologist who'll be a member of the Department of Medicine and will practice uh, in, the, uh, in the clinical setting. We spend a great deal of time in the department thinking about building community, whether it's building community amongst our, uh, our central staff or uh, with our faculty who are, are constantly um, tweeting and posting on Facebook some of their activities of engaging each other in the community. And for those of you, as, as you heard from Jack, we're up to 50 people listening to this via Zoom. Uh, there's new tools being used throughout the department, throughout the school, throughout uh, Stanford Medicine both with video capabilities, but also tools to allow teams to work together more efficiently. And for those of you who haven't tried using a tool like Slack, it is a great way to, uh, to connect teams and uh, share messages, archive messages, uh, documents, et cetera, in a way that I think facilitates our work as we move around more broadly. We have uh, Colonel Winslow and uh, Professor Parsonette here on, the, on this slide on our Facebook page. And uh, this is another great way to post research. You can see Calvin Quo uh, as his research is, uh, is posted on Facebook. While it's um, really great to get cited a couple of times because somebody cited your paper, it's also fantastic to expose your paper to tens of thousands of individuals who might pick it up through social media and be interested in it. 
As I said, we're interested, and one of the things we hear from the faculty climate survey is how do we do a better job of building community? Well, under Errol Osdago's leadership and Lindsay Baker, who's in the back, we've really done, they've done great work in uh, our annual reports. We can call it an annual report now because we've produced two of them with a third to come. And uh, yeah, Errol was a little suspect when I suggested we call it annual report year one. He said, let's call it report to the community. And, uh, and we did that the first year, but now it's our annual report. This year, the theme was collaboration and we'll be uh, collecting stories and, um, uh, and, and information about programs later this summer for one to come out later in the fall or winter. And as I said, this is the third of, uh, of the state of the departments that, uh, that we gave. I think I was wearing the same suit last year when I look at this now. That, uh, <laughs> My wife didn't catch that this morning. But now let's talk about some of the research highlights. And uh, you all have done an extraordinary job. Uh, when I arrived in, uh, in the NIH rankings, as you know, is just one measure of, uh, of how one gauges success as a department. Um, but it's an important measure. It's an important measure for a variety of reasons. But I do, I do think it tells a good story that you all have uh, progressed from 19th in the NIH rankings to now 10. Um, but I ordinarily don't put a slide like this out here because I don't want it to be a focus about trying to move up the rankings, but I want to make a very specific point. You can see that we sit at about number 10, uh, just under $100 million in annual NIH funding. You can see that the top five is within about $10 million. And if you look at the top 100 Department of Medicine um, investigators across the country, many of those top schools, half of their portfolio is supported by four or five large team-based grants. Whereas if you look at Stanford in that top 100, we have two people. One, Harry Greenberg, who's the PI on, uh, on the CTSA. And the second is Mark Mewson. But we have no, no others. We have no big team science grants, et cetera. And Calvin Quo, Ken Mahaffey, and I have talked a lot about this, that in an era of team science where a lot of the grants are multi-PI, larger grants, we really should be in that. And, the, uh, and, and I, because I think of the quality of science that we have and it's a topic we're going to come back to. If you think about some of the things we do in laboratory discovery science, it's, it's absolutely extraordinary. Some of you may have attended uh, the CVI-sponsored um, drug discovery conference a few weeks ago, and it was incredible. It was uh, seven, eight hundred people had registered for it. It was a day packed with, uh, with interactions with Stanford scientists, community-based scientists from biotech, venture capitalists, entrepreneurs, uh, government uh, leaders. It was really an incredible day. Connie Wyan is a great example of someone who is uh, both clinically active in the areas of vasculitis and in rheumatology and also a, a first-rate scientist. Crystal Mackle recruited both to pediatrics and medicine to lead up our efforts in uh, immunotherapy. I think is someone you'll be seeing more and more in the Department of Medicine. But maybe the, the slide I'm most, uh, or the, the, the tweet that I'm most pleased to put up here is from Joy Wu who, working with a series of leaders within the department, science leaders, really was successful in helping us to recruit nine physician scientists this year as translational investigative pathway uh, investigators into our residency program. So nine out of uh, a categorical class of 34 is nothing short of extraordinary. And so kudos to, uh, to the faculty leaders and welcome to our, uh, our new TIP interns. In clinical research, uh, I'll point out that the Department of Medicine represents about a third of all the clinical research done in the school, and it's really broad in terms of what they're doing. Uh, there's digital health projects. Uh, for those of you who have heard Sam Gambier and Ken Mahaffey and I, George Sledge, David Marin, talk about the Google Baseline project, what did you say it was, Ken? We signed the CDA three years ago. Uh, we finally enrolled the first subject in baseline today, so uh, that was quite an accomplishment to, uh, to the SCCR team. So just a tremendous amount of diversity going on in clinical research. Here's uh, Project Baseline. All of those of you who have wondered, can you be a subject in Project Baseline? Yes, you can. Go to projectbaseline.com and uh, you can register on the website. And how many have registered now, Ken? 
1,500 people have already registered with their interest in the Bay Area, and uh, Ken and I most care that that's about three times the number that have registered in North Carolina. So, uh, so, that, so that's a good thing. Not that we're competitive about this. Um, other things in the clinical research translational side, Josh Knowles, as many of you know, a young scientist in uh, cardiology. And uh, sorry, Negan, one of my favorite informaticians profession on this is, uh, is doing some really interesting work. And for those of you who saw his grand rounds as a research parasite was really, I think, one of the highlights of the grand rounds year. And this is a paper that I think says a lot about Stanford, and this is work being done by Marcella Alzen, in, uh, who's an infectious disease specialist and an economist, and, uh, and has done really interesting work on the economic implications of the Tuskegee experiments. And uh, Doug Owen, who I saw earlier, had told me that the paper was just accepted for publication in one of the major economics journals. And for those of you who follow that space, uh, the publication of four or five really high profile economics paper is enough for you to get tenure at most major universities uh, because it takes a couple of years to get these papers completed and published. So kudos to, uh, to Marcella from PCOR. On the, uh, on the clinical front, a lot going on. Here's a nice tweet. I like to see David Speck tweeting and uh, trying to use it to uh, improve care. We have our GI group talking about gastroparesis out there on Twitter. One of our former chief residents leading uh, resident rounds, uh, Lauren Chung, working on uh, virtual primary care and, again, bedside rounds. Our clinicians are doing really fantastic work, and maybe it's exemplified, at least in part, by uh, the growth of the clinical enterprise by work being done in, uh, in primary care. I see Song back there. I think I saw Megan. Yeah, there's Megan here as well. And I think one of the really extraordinary things is that the presence that Stanford Primary Care now has throughout the region is nothing short of remarkable. Somehow, I don't know, Song, how San Diego snuck on here, but San Diego is staffed by Stanford Primary Care physicians and is, I think, just a great example of the kind of creative, innovative programs that we have. Um, and you can see, and you all know this, and this is some of the stressors that our clinicians feel. Things are getting busy, busier and busier. And they're getting busier because people want to come to Stanford. They want to come to Stanford Medicine. They see what all of you do is really best in the area. And, uh, and it is getting busier and busier. Uh, our primary care doctors are seeing almost 2,500 new patients, new patients a month and trying to understand then the secondary care needs, the tertiary care needs, the quaternary care needs of that group is, uh, is nothing short of remarkable. And again, work RVUs is just a measure of how much is going on clinically, and it is extraordinary. It's projected that this year in the Department of Medicine, work RVUs will exceed a million work RVUs. Now, that's a lot of clinical activity in a relatively small amount of clinical space. And this is an issue as we begin to think about things like Redwood City, as we begin to think about sites in the community, we have to think about being creative and innovative in the way that we deliver care, including things like telemedicine and some of the programs that are going on in primary care, and a telemedicine program that will be launched this next year in preventive cardiology, the kind of things that we want to encourage. I made reference to Ann and Paul's leadership in the quality retreat. And we hope we'll see many of you at, uh, at this year's uh, retreat. And some of you may remember um, Maureen when she came and gave medical grand rounds uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, she was absolutely fantastic, and we're looking forward to having her spend the day with us talking about the value equation in healthcare. Uh, she works in Don Berwick's um, uh, healthcare innovation group in Massachusetts. But one of the things that really makes Stanford Stanford is that we can move from all the way from the most basic of discovery science to both talking about in a very poetic way and studying the effect that the human aspect of medicine has upon all of us. And you can see some of the work done by Steve Ash, some of the work done by uh, my, my friend and colleague Abraham about really trying to understand the human element of medicine is important to us in the department as the science element of medicine. Well, let's talk a little bit about education. 
and uh, these were our educators for care in the medical school. And the Department of Medicine is really the, 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 the backbone of this. More than half the educators for care come from the Department of Medicine. A uh, special shout out to Lars, to Jeff, to John, who are doing tremendous leadership. Lars in creating the, uh, the Teaching Academy. Uh, John now in leading our clerkships has been really a tremendous uh, help for the department and really encouraging some of the best Stanford students to, uh, to choose internal medicine as a pathway. You can see that some of the, uh, you see one of our great, great educators at the, bed, at the bedside here and the variety of opportunities that our medical students have to interact with all of you as faculty. And really in any department of medicine, you need to pause when you talk about the residency program because the residency program in the department of medicine is really in many ways both what defines us and what binds us together. Because if you think about us all being in very, very different specialties, cardiology, hematology, infectious disease, rheumatology, primary care, but we all emerge from this common background of training in internal medicine. And it really is our residency program, which is the backbone of, uh, of a good department of medicine or a great department of medicine has to have a great residency program. And I do really believe that we have a great residency program. And a lot of the leadership of the uh, residency program are here. And this is just, uh, this is a picture taken from this year's retreat with our residents. Uh, I have to take the special uh, shout out to, uh, to Ron Rotalis, who's really tremendous leadership of, uh, and you can see his sartorial splendor that the residents and fellows are emulating as well these days. That Ron is really a terrific leader of the residency program and uh, maybe Alec Perino will have his job in a few years, but for now it's, uh, it's Ron. And no great internal medicine residency program runs without the fuel of the chief residents and we have three of the best this year uh, with Tanya, Ash and Naomi and uh, there you can see them on bow tie Thursday that uh, led by bedside rounds with, uh, with Professor Verghese and uh, he suggested I wear a bow tie today and I told him I didn't think that was going to happen. <laughs> now match day is always an exciting day. Um, I love this picture of uh, you know the interns and residents gathered around to, first of all there's an there's an incredulousness of, you mean someone's going to take my job? And, uh, and then there's a real joy in seeing the kind of residents that we attract every year. And this year is no exception with 47 absolutely exceptional uh, medical students who chose to join us for residency. And at the end of the year, there's always a poignancy when our residents leave. Uh, this is our graduating uh, resident dinner that was held a few weeks ago. Uh, it's, it's an extraordinary night because what you remark upon is that they enter really as students. They've just finished medical school and they leave as doctors. They leave as general internists. And it really is a, a extraordinary progression that takes place as all of you know. But just look at this. This was the accomplishments of this year's group of uh, residents. So in addition to working their 80 hours a week, they're also publishing manuscripts, they're publishing at, uh, they're, they're presenting at conferences, they're writing textbook chapters and look at what they're going on to do. And uh, that's really extraordinary. And if you have a chance to, uh, to meet them, I think you'll all agree with that. They're also a pretty smart group uh, that over the course of the last five years has been 100% ABIM board pass rate. And while board scores don't tell the whole story of any residency class, the fact that all of our residents pass, I think, is a testament to the uh, quality of the education. Now, as I said earlier, uh, one of the things we hear from the faculty in the climate survey is the importance of inclusiveness. And we want to be a department that focuses on inclusiveness. And in order to do so, we really need leadership in this area. And I really have to say that Wendy Caceres has done a, a job above and beyond uh, over this course of this last year, really helping us lead a lot of the efforts in, uh, in diversity and inclusiveness. And one of the programs that the department is involved with this summer and uh, a tip of the hat to, uh, to, again, to Abraham for the relationship that we've struck up with Mahari, one of the uh, historically black colleges that, uh, that now has two of its uh, first year medical students uh, spending the summer on campus uh, in science programs. And uh, we hope that this is something we can build upon over the course of the next couple of years. I made reference to the uh, Translational Investigator Program, and I would be remiss if I didn't thank the leaders along the bottom, Calvin, Ravi, Joy, 
Jeff, Vinicio, and Josh. The, the, the amount of work that went into uh, this, I think, is, uh, is really spectacular, and I think it's really allowed us to recruit some of the country's best uh, medical students who want to come here to train clinically and to do science. And we have a large residency class program with about 120 residents. But we also, throughout the department, have about 150 fellows and about another 120 or so postdocs. And uh, in, in many ways, the fellows, the clinical fellows, make up the backbone of a lot of clinical services. So thank you to all the Stanford uh, subspecialty fellows in the Department of Medicine. You can also see that many of our fellows are quite active on social media, and you can, uh, you can follow them and learn some interesting things, including some things that Errol cautions them not to do on social media. And I, I like to say when I go to the Employee of the Month celebration that, um, that you really, it takes a village to run a Department of Medicine. And, uh, and the village that we have is, uh, is populated by some of the best staff that are in any Department of Medicine. And uh, this is our Employee of the Month recognition group who uh, take time out of their busy week to go ahead and try to select one of their colleagues as the employee of the month. Now, the one thing I've pointed out to my colleague, Kathy Garzio, is that there's terrible gender diversity in this picture. <laughs> that somehow we need to have another man or two on this, uh, on this group. But then she tells me that it's the women that actually are doing the work. So, uh, uh, but here are 2016 winners, and Kathy and I get to go around the department and meet the different winners. And here's pictures of our 2017 winners that they, uh, they, they do receive a, uh, a series of prizes, including an iPad. But I think part of what they receive more than anything is the, uh, the joy of hearing what their colleagues have to say about them, which is actually quite fun and something that we always enjoy. Our staff like to have fun, too. And uh, th these are some of the pictures from recent staff events. I love this one, best of all, from the endocrine division. And, uh, but our staff do like to have fun. This is from the outdoor barbecue. It's from some of the recognition uh, luncheons that we have. And again, uh, kudos to the staff, because none of us could do these jobs if it weren't for the staff. Let's talk a little bit about the finances, because now you get to see where we actually are investing money from the department. You can see over the course of the years that, not surprising, with the growth of the clinical enterprise, with the growth of research, uh, that the revenue of the department has uh, increased, as have the expenditures, not surprisingly. But I'd like to just take a moment and comment on a few things, the first of which is uh, we are an unusual department of medicine in that less than half of our revenue comes from the delivery of health care. Now, if you look at most of our peers in the East Coast, that number is more like 75, 80 percent of what they do is supported by clinical revenue. And I think what this is saying to, uh, to me is that this is a really incredible department in terms of uh, what we do, the quality of your science, that 40 percent of the revenue, a department of our size, comes from research dollars. That's absolutely incredible. Not surprisingly, mostly what we spend it on is, uh, is faculty, staff, <coughs> um, salaries because that is the backbone of a group like ours, which is people. But I also want to uh, point out the amount of money that is being invested in education and science, I think is really important to note. And it's important to note because these are dollars coming from the clinical side of the house, is that the work that's being done every day by the clinicians allows us to invest substantial amounts of money into research. And so the reason I show this is to point out the importance of what we all do as an interconnected entity, that we really need each other to be the best Department of Medicine possible, to be able to invest $10 million this year in faculty recruitment, to be able to support $4 million worth of salary support of our UTL and NTL faculty. There's a tremendous amount of money, $32 million, going into the support of science and education. And, uh, and I think that that's important because that's ultimately what we're here to do, deliver great care, advance science, and to train the next generation. We're an incredibly collaborative department. We have a lot of people elsewhere on campus who have joint appointments in the department, and a lot of you have appointments elsewhere in the university. Well, let me close with what I think what's one of the most fun part of, uh, of the presentation, and that is some of the awards. Again, full disclaimer, if I left you out, it was not intentional. Please come to Grand Rounds tomorrow, where one of the most important awards given by the Department of Medicine is the Hewlett Award. 
And uh, this really rep recognizes some of the most outstanding, long-standing faculty members in the department. In fact, as I look out, there's a lot of Udall Award winners in the, uh, in the audience. And tomorrow is, uh, is Rich Pop. Uh, Rich's title is uh, Understanding the Heart from the Inside Out. Some of you will know this, that Rich is one of the pioneers in the development of, uh, of cardiac echo and uh, is really a tremendous individual. And I'm looking forward to his grand round tomorrow morning. So please do uh, come 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. Our teaching awards given out annually uh, and largely orchestrated by Kelly Skeff is, a, uh, is always a fun day. I want to acknowledge Mark Newson who was elected this year to the Institute of Medicine, now called the National Academy of Medicine. And I made reference to Mark earlier with regard to his status as a scientist, and it's been acknowledged by the Institute of Medicine. Uh, Paul Boyke, I like putting this one in there because people think I'm supporting Paul as a Harrington scholar, but actually it's from uh, Case Western University, no relationship, but, uh, but you're welcome nonetheless, Paul. Joe Wu, uh, CVI director, is uh, one of two just one of two uh, American Heart Association Merit Award winners this year uh, for the terrific work that he does. Ada and Sid actually showing in a Synergy Award how two scientists working from different areas of medicine can collaborate and uh, try to tackle some of the vexing problems in this case of inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, Catherine and Taya, uh, two of the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub investigators and I'll point out that there's only a handful at the entire university. Two of them are in the Department of Medicine. And as Dr. Singh reminds me, both of them are in the Division of uh, Infectious Disease. So kudos to uh, the ID division. Also equally well in acknowledgment of our, uh, our mid-career scientists, Ash, Ada, and Ravi again as uh, new inductees into ASCI. And there's a lot of the senior faculty in this room who spend a lot of time trying to uh, get applications together, et cetera. I see Glenn Church on the back. He's always a stalwart at this. Uh, but kudos to Ash, Ada, and Ravi. Um, Sanjay Basu and the whole notion of open access to data uh, was one of the winners of the uh, Sprint Data Challenge that came forward from the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, Sanjay, a member of PCOR and SPRC, is, uh, is acknowledged for that. And well, okay, I said I was going to show mostly young people, but, uh, but, I, but, but I, it would be uh, re remiss if I didn't acknowledge Ron Levy, who is uh, obviously an outstanding pioneer in immunotherapy for cancer, who's been awarded this year NCI designation as an outstanding investigator. So kudos, George, to medical oncology and the leadership of Ron. And this is an award that I particularly like to see as we think about the spirit of diversity and inclusiveness with Nancy Morioka Douglas, who's receiving the Augustus White Professionalism Award from Dr. White, as I understand it. And uh, Dr. White is the first African-American graduate of, uh, of Stanford Medical School. And this is an award to celebrate diversity and inclusiveness and programs designed to, uh, to do just that. So here's our senior associate, Dean uh, Bonney, receiving, uh, presenting the award with uh, the help of Dr. White to, uh, to Nancy. Amy Bott. Uh, one of two winners in the department of the Rosencrantz Prize for Healthcare Research, Amy's studying the microbiome as, uh, as a source of etiology of noncommunicable diseases in, uh, in Africa. I never thought I'd have a conversation with an oncologist about diabetes in Africa, but she did talk with me about that recently. And Mike Bacci from, uh, from SPRC, most recent winner of a Rosencrantz Prize for Healthcare Research. And I think this points out, again, the diversity of Stanford faculty. Mike is a biostatistician using big data to look at the problem of rape and violence against women in Africa. And so if you don't think that's an extraordinary way to make a commitment, um, just pause and think about that again. Mark Genovese, uh, one of the top 10 advances in clinical research this past year uh, by the Clinical Research Forum. Uh, it's not a great picture of Mark, but we love the x-rays behind him. <laughs> and Ewan Ashley with a, uh, a substantial team award in, uh, for molecular transducers of physical activity in humans. And uh, Ewan continues to do some really creative, amazing things. So kudos to him. Poonam and Chitra, I saw, I saw at least Chitra here, who's been elected to uh, the Bo National Board of Directors of the uh, Allergy Association, and Poonam, who's been recognized by the Society of General General Medicine as an outstanding clinician educator, one of our uh, outstanding hospital medicine specialists. Andy Hoffman, endocrinologist and uh, vice chair for academic affairs. Andy would probably kill me if he knew I put his picture in here, but he is one of the uh, school's inductees this year. 
into uh, to A to triple to triple AS, and uh, and I think I saw Karen back here, who uh, won the Parmley Award this year from the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. This is an award given in memory of Bill Parmley, who was a long-term editor of uh, the journal uh, and who was long uh, faculty member at UCSF. It's one of the highest awards that the journal gives. So congratulations, and finally. Uh, Abraham uh, received, uh, I'd like to say from the president, but from the former president, uh, Barack Obama, the National Humanities Medal, and a lot of us had fun watching it that day on the, uh, on the television in, uh, in the department, and uh, this was really something very special. So congratulations, Abraham. So let me close with just a couple of the things that we're thinking about over the next couple of years and how we can enlist you for help in this exercise. Uh, you can see that people uh, believe that we can improve the climate of our department by providing opportunities to enhance our sense of community. Uh, and what we really want to ask your help with as we move forward over the next couple of years, as we think about all of our programs, what I'd ask you to think about throughout is transparency, equity, collaboration, diversity and inclusiveness, and having a healthy and engaged workforce. I'm really happy that... Uh, th that uh, the Health and Human Performance Group is joining the department because I think it will help us think not just about healthiness of the workforce, but also the kind of research and educational programs we can align on. We're very interested in our strategic recruitment. Um, I don't think we'll be growing at the same pace we'll be growing at, but we're going to be, I think, growing much more strategically. We intend to continue to invest in research and education as we've been doing and to do it in a sustainable way. And we really want to create an environment where people want to stay here at Stanford. We don't want to create an environment where people feel as though uh, it's a pyramid system. Uh, we, want it to be a, we want it to be an environment where we hire you as an assistant professor, we support you as an associate professor, and we celebrate you as a professor. We really want our faculty here throughout their careers. And with that, and with help of the leadership group, we're really focusing on these thematic areas, recruitment and retention of faculty and staff, educational par paradigm, including innovation and teaching, team science, a theme we've come back to several times today, building a healthy community, and inclusiveness in decision making and communication. And so what's the commitment from the department to the department? Uh, communication is not key, and we're going to be asking you for your ideas about how we can do better at it. Um, everyone needs coaching and encouragement to improve, and let us know what we can do to help and what we can do better. We're going to use inclusiveness and wellness as a framework for our decisions and actions. Part of the exercise of going through talking about awards is to recognize people. And for those of you who have walked by my office, there's now a television screen with a lot of, well, when the baseball games aren't on, I, we, are, we are showing uh, recognition and awards and things that the department is doing. So please, if you have information, news stories, send them to Errol, send them to Lindsay. Uh, we want to develop bench straight, we want more leadership development, and we have some fabulous programs that we're investing in for young faculty in leadership development. And we will continue to review compensation, other financial information to be fair, to be equitable, and to really make decisions that's going to be success, make success for all of us. So again, thank you for uh, allowing me to be part of uh, leading this department. Uh, and thanks for the great job that you do, and I'm also happy to answer any questions for you uh, before we break. So thank you very much. <laughs> there must be a question. Ah, they, okay. Alistair. And if there's people online who want to ask, you can just, uh, what's the mechanism by which they ask, Errol? They've been sending you questions? Yeah. Excellent. Hey, great. So thanks so much. That was engaging, informative. And one of the most encouraging things I, I felt was the, the real focus on the wellness. And I know in the hospital division, we actually talk about wellness and focus on some specific aspect about it every meeting, which I think is very valuable and shows the priorities. And I was curious if um, other divisions are going to be doing something similar or are doing something similar. Um, and if not, if that's something that probably should be something that's constantly reinforced. Um, and part two of that also is there's a lot of focus on the kind of proximal side, preventing um, feelings of not being engaged. But I'm curious what kind of strategies are being thought about or implemented on the other side when people are already at that point. 
Yeah, so great question. We, we created a program this year under Kathy's leadership called Making Space where uh, a group of faculty broken into two cohorts, largely younger, more junior faculty, though not exclusively, and largely uh, women faculty, though not exclusively, were invited to participate. This is both to um, focus on leadership development, but also on a sense of, uh, of how to balance work and life, how to uh, manage stressful situations, how to provide to think about wellness in uh, one's professional life. And I, what we're talking about now us is after a year of, or half a year of doing this, how do we scale it? And so we have some ideas that we'll be rolling out to the different divisions because we would like it to be more part of what we do. With the addition of Eric and Chris's program, we'd also like to make it part of the research that we do. And one of the things we're looking at in making space is how do we actually study the effect that this might have. Tate Chenefeld, when he arrives, will also have a real imperative for, um, for both not just the educational piece of health and wellness, but the research piece. So more to come. Errol, any questions from online? Come Nothing yet. Nothing yet. Any, any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much for coming out. I'll be around for a bit if anyone has questions. And uh, again, congratulations on a great year, and uh, we look forward to next year. Thank you. Yeah, I stood stone like at midnight, suspended in my 